Good morning, scuba girls and guys. This is Terry with Scuba Girls International. I am here. I'm going to try really hard not to fangirl out, um, but um, I am spending the morning this morning just a little bit of time with my scuba diving idol, Christina Zanato. Um, good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I cannot thank you enough for being here. Um, you'll have to forgive me. I'm a little on the um, pollen apocalypse side here of uh, Atlanta during the spring and sound like I'm going to fall over, but I feel much better than I sound. Um, Christina has a million and one accolades to her name. Um, shark behavioralist, underwater cave explorer, um, ocean conservation champion, uh, your photographer, your public speaker, writer, um, mom of the cutest fur babies ever. Um, <laughs> I absolutely love that you post so much about your puppies. Um, you are not only a diving icon and heroine to so many women across the globe, um, but you're also an actress. We've seen a little bit of you and some of the work that you've done on fun things like Shark Week. Um, but, you know, I think that you personally are overall just one of the most amazing women. Um, I've followed you for a very long time now. Um, not just, you know, what you tweet or, you know, your YouTube videos. Um, I, I think that you are an incredible female leader in the dive community. And one of the things that excites me the most is that you just don't stop. Um, and that, that resonates with me personally quite a bit. Um, I, I too am one of those women who is just constantly going, give me something else. What's next? What's next? What's next? Um, as I shared with you um, in my request, um, I am currently finishing um, ITC for SSI. My IE is just around the corner. Um, I've got some incredible support backing me up, but, uh, you know, the next thing after that is moving on to, um, closed circuit rebreather. Um, uh, so like, like you, there's always something else that's next. There's always something new. Um, one of the things that I wanted to know, um, from you, um, you've been diving with the sharks in the Bahamas for 20 plus years. Um, one of the things that I admire is that you're, you're always out there. It's not just, oh, I'm going out today and then I'm not back out for, you know, weeks or months at a time. Um, you live out there. Um, the shark behavior, what I see is that the, they recognize you. They're, they're constantly coming up to you. And I, it seems family-like to me. Um, one of the things in my research in understanding sharks and sharks' behavior is most of the time that they are solitary creatures, but they also seem to have behavior patterns of smaller groups, not just during mating. Um, can you shed any light on that? I mean, I'm not a shark expert. I'm, I just, I love sharks. I now I'm in the process of learning more. Um, but I would love to know your thoughts on sharks when they become in groups or when they're seen off in say one or twos and they're hanging out together. Cause I've, I mean, I've been in many locations in the Bahamas where you see smaller groups and it's not necessarily mating season. So I'm assuming there's other behaviors that pull them together and bring them together other than just mating season? Yes. Um, uh, the concept of, of like how sharks behavior ha behave has to go back to the word sharks. And that is the thing we can't just say, well, all sharks do this, so all sharks do that. So you have solitary sharks as well as you have gregarious sharks. We know that there's giant schools of hammerheads in places like Guadalupe or, or the uh, Cocos Islands, we also have uh, solitary behaviors, usually tradition of the great whites, but then as we tag them and follow them, we do realize that actually they do uh, work around in small groups. So it's not just mating, and it could be that is reciprocal support. It could be that they're hunting together. There's quite a lot of that. If you look into during the sardine runs, how sharks actually are hunting in the same place. There's not one size of fit all in, in shark behavior, especially when we start saying, well, why do they do this? So the Caribbean reef shark is uh, um, 
somewhat of a gregarious animals. They don't mind being together, spending time together in smaller groups. Uh, the males and the females tend to be separated though during uh, the rest of the year when it's not mating. So when you look at my shiro sharks, primarily they're females. And then around on the reef, you'll find the other males that tend to uh, be together, but not come into the female group. That's fascinating. Um, what was the first experience that you had with sharks that you can remember way, way back in the day where you're just like, I want to work with these guys all the time. They're fascinating creatures. I, I need to go learn more and study more and be more a part of their ecosystem. Well, I had a childhood dream of having sharks for friends. So that was my, <laughs> my thing is I'm going to grow up and I'm going to have sharks for friends. But then my first experience with them was my first ocean dive, which was here on Grand Bahama Island. When then I decided to make this uh, my, my place where to live and where I'm still professionally working. So it was my first checkout dive as an open water diver when diving and there was Caribbean reef sharks swimming around. I was like, oh, you have sharks here? And the instructors were a little bit kind of like, yeah, dummy, of course we have sharks here. <laughs> and then just, you know, what you, but I grew up with the notion that sharks are very hard to find and very difficult to see. Uh, luckily, I grew up with the notion where <clears throat> sharks are not, were not considered monsters or dangerous. My dad said they're very elusive, they're very difficult to find. And he used to say there are no monsters in the sea, only the way the one you make up in your head. So when I came here and there were sharks, I was just totally and out of 100% taken. And literally in one week, I changed my life around to come back here and continue dive while I worked uh, in a different industry. And then when I became a diving professional, I did the hop over. And that was uh, uh, more than 20 years plus. We're approaching 30, 30 years that I've been here doing this. Yeah, I, uh, I understand that your uh, previous life before uh, the water was the hospitality industry. I, I had a stint in that myself. Um, I'm, I thought it was going to be a great career. And then um, life took me a different direction, as things often do. Um, uh, one of my first experiences with sharks, I was terrified. I, I just, no one was going to get me to go on that shark dive. I, I, I had um, a snorkel experience. They were feeding the sharks down below. And I'm like, I'm on the surface. I look like a turtle and I'm not going to become snack food. Um, but I didn't know enough then, you know, a little bit of reading, a little bit of research um, and spending time in the water where you're they're everywhere, you know, uh, especially in the Bahamas, there's no shortage of finding or seeing sharks, which is probably one of my favorite places to dive. Um, what is next for you uh, in, in what you have going on in your world? I think that you, you are constantly uh, being a go-getter yourself, there's always something on your plate, always something new. Um, I, I've watched a lot of your photography, um, with your partner and, and I uh, correct me if I'm wrong now, husband, um, mm -hmm. uh, now how does he pronounce his name? Cause I, I want to say it is Kevin. It's I, Kevin. I, okay. I was like, Kevin. That's Kevin? okay. Everybody goes with that's Kevin. It's just spelled <laughs> a little bit differently, but it's I love Kevin. it. Um, so the photography that you guys have done his recent, the shoot that you recently did with him playing underwater with his guitar. That was fabulous. Um, being a musician myself, I was just like, okay, that's probably one of the coolest things I have ever seen. Uh, just being able to take an instrument underwater and play it and capture not only the images, but the video was superb. That was pretty cool. Um, so what do you guys have next? What's, what's next for you either by yourself in your own career and what goals you still want to accomplish or even as a couple and, and what you guys hope to accomplish together in the underwater world? My goodness. Uh, we, we have quite a lot and in a certain uh, way we have quite of the same. One of the things a lot of people says, Oh, what's your next project? What's your next expedition? You're just going to like, well, you know, we live our expeditions. We are here. I, have gear in my living room and I can grab a bag <laughs> after I hang up from you can head out of the door and go cave exploring if I want to. Uh, we have quite a few things lined up. Um, we definitely are going to explore more of the photography slash music. This is kind of a little bit of a um, it's going to have a little bit of a mix. It's going to require his talent for playing guitar 
with our underwater, uh, I call it fantasy imaging, like these yeah. unique images that come up that are not like traditional on scuba. And um, that one will have take us a little bit away from the scuba diving and bring us more into the music world and connect the two. Then we have uh, some work in progress. It's a long-term project. We have quite a lot of issues right now in the Bahamas with permitting. So we're working on receiving a scientific permit to do that. Uh, but we're definitely on the track of uh, sharks are protected in the Bahamas. Um, but sometimes the protecting sharks does not mean they are completely protected. We need to protect their food. We need to protect where they go and leave their babies. And so our next research plan through our little nonprofit, People of the Water, is to actually track some of our girls because we know them. We know which one is pregnant. We know which one is going to mate and see where are they literally going? And is this an area of interest that maybe we need, we need it to protect? And then from a cave diving point of view, we have, uh, uh, again, permitting wise, we're waiting for that, but we have quite a few, uh, a story that we need to tell about the exploration of two brand new cave systems we did in 2020. Those are the outside of the boundaries of the day-to-day -day stuff, which includes obviously uh, shark courses, cave diving, cave exploration for our own pleasure, and all the other things that we do uh, while we're here. But those are the three main projects that you're looking at for now. Yeah, I, I was pretty excited when I was doing uh, my own personal research around uh, people of the water and understanding what it exactly it is that your mission is. Um, I, I think it's absolutely fabulous looking to not only educate and uh, bring people together around conservation, um, but the, just the mission is, is pretty amazing. Um, for, for caves and cave exploring, um, this is something that is, uh, I'm, I'm not dabbling into yet, but that is next on my list. Um, I, I have to, I have, I'm one of those people, I got to finish what I started. So I have to finish IE, but then, um, I have seen you have gone through a good number of the systems in the Bahamas. You have some incredible, incredible images that you've captured in some of your cave exploring with uh, you and Kevin. And um, I'm curious, which location is your favorite and why? Like I know that's, which that's one asking. is my favorite puppy? <laughs> that's which hard. Which one is your favorite right? puppy? Um, there's many. Uh, there's two. Uh, one is historically connected to my uh, passion for cave diving, and that's Ben's Cave right here on Grand Bahama Island. Ben's mm -hmm. Cave, I did my first cavern tour. Uh, for those that don't know the difference, cavern is the first room, and you can see, see the daylight cave is beyond the daylight zone. But I did my first cavern tour with Ben Rose, after whom the cave is named, uh, as my 11th log dive. Ever. Wow. And I immediately fell in love with the overhead environment. And then it took me about two years because obviously you need a little bit more experience to uh, go and become a, a full cave diver and then come back and start exploring. My relationship with Ben's Cave is deep as the Ben's Cave itself had been closed for nearly 30 years. And I was the first one to receive a permit to go back in and map the system to then propose the protection over the entire extent of the cave. So the park protected a certain part of the cave. They said, oh, this is the part what Ben's Cave is, but they protected the entrance. But there's a, a kilometers and kilometers, just like a, some of the tunnels are 4,600 feet long away wow. from the entrance, right? That means you need to protect all the extent over the cave. So I got that first permit back in 2008, mapped it with the old system. And then recently with Kevin and new technology, we've been able to do interactive maps and 3D maps. So Benscape has this unique place in my heart. And then last year we were granted for the first time ever the right to actually guide people in Benscape. Wow. It's a very selective way of doing it. It's very one-on-one -on -one private. Uh, has to be a fairly accomplished cave diver, but it's so beautiful, the fun that we're able to take. And some parts I said, these are off limits. They're too small, too delicate, or too demanding. But we have some amazing places. And the other place I think it's that has a unique uh, place for me is a Sweden ski. Sweden ski has this mix of caves called the Zodiac systems. Mm -hmm. 
And the names of the entrances are Sagittarius, Gemini, Virgo, oh, uh, Pisces, Scorpio. <laughs> and uh, they were originally explored by Rob Palmer back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And they kind of like did something. And then people through the years came. It's fairly remote. It's expedition style. So to me, it adds to the pleasure of going cave diving there. But I also there in 2015, I connected some of these systems together. This used to be a big system and it's absolutely stunning. So we also organize obviously dives there for a, a cave divers. So primarily our cave divers need to be side mount cave divers. Makes but sense. these two places really have my absolute, you know, um, passion, but it's kind of hard to pick. I mean, like I said, in 2020, we discovered two brand new caves. Like imagine you're in the 21st century and actually no one has ever put foot inside that hole. You know, as cave divers, you think, oh, well, most likely all the caves are known. I have expanded caves that were known before, like I did in the Zodiac system, like I did in Benz, like we did in Mermaids. But to find two new entrances and being able to put in more than 15 miles of lines. That's outstanding. In a place that no one else has ever been before. It's absolutely amazing. When you're when you're in those positions and you're cave exploring um, and no one has ever been there and you're literally in brand new territory, what are some of the things that you go through in your mind to to keep yourself calm like oh my gosh this is so exciting this is new no one's ever been here i'm i'm literally trying to map as i go and what are some of the things that you go through while you're going through brand new spaces the first and foremost is a check 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 so i'm going through the new space and yes there is excitement of where to go and obviously i have to look and try to figure it out i i usually say the cave speaks to me Um, People imagine when you're exploring, you just enter a tunnel and it just reveals itself to you. Sometimes it does that, (laughs) which is really, really cool. But sometimes you're like somewhere and you're like, "Uh, which direction should I go? So there is that part. But as I do that, there's a constant personal check. My rebreather, Mm -hmm. uh, my my mental state, how far I've been swimming, how do I feel? Am I becoming tired? Um, Am I becoming distracted? Have I made some mistakes already? So it's a check, check, check. And I'm constantly check my well being as well as my gear, my instruments uh, to make sure that those are the primary determining factors of what I do. And I've done it before. I've actually talked about it in one of my posts. I um, I was exploring and it was one of those, I went down the tunnel and I reached the end of the cave and then I came back and I was like, oh, I'm going to uh, visit here. And I came back and I reached the end of that tunnel there. And then I came back here and I went this way. And I remember in one of those, I marked my way out incorrectly. I put the arrow pointing out, actually pointing into the tunnel. So I finished doing all these spider web search and then I start following the arrow I was like, wait a minute, I just came here. I just explore this. So I came back and I knew that I'd done a mistake. And so what I did, I switched the arrow. And at that point I said, and you're going out. Because I knew that that mistake might be, might be indicative of being mentally tired of all this exploration I've been doing. So that exploration comes secondary to me, my gear, and my well-being. Safety, Absolutely. I completely understand that. Uh, So what advice would you give to those who are interested potentially in cave diving? Obviously, when you're not there yet, you are miles away from exploring. But those who have interests, women who see that the cave diving, cavern diving, closed circuit rebreather game is typically male centric. Yes, there are some amazing women who dive on the technical side. There needs to be more of us. Yes. So... What advice would you give to those, myself included, um, who are on that journey or considering that journey and investing their time, energy, and financial uh, to get started on that side of diving? Well, that's you just said it. You need to invest time, a lot of it. You need to invest energy, um, even more of that. And you need to invest a financial a humongous portion of that. Mm. I usually try to explain to people, would you buy a second hand, a space suit to go in space? (laughs) Or would you buy a first hand? And so when you're cave diving, you're that remotely, you're so, you're not 
even attach an umbilical cord like a space person, you're right. actually completely self-reliant. So you need to have those three lined up or at least make them work in small sections. You don't have to invest all the financial at once, but you would really need to have time and commitment. From a male-dominated point of view, my thing is when they say you can't, your answer is watch me. That's why I'm here. That is exactly (laughs) why I'm here. My very first experience, I was told no. I'm like, well, let's see how well that works for you. (laughs) Watch me. And that means if if you can't uh, do it right away, put in the time. Now, there is a high level of skills required. Yes. So if you're thinking about cave diving, I say make sure your basics uh, swimming, so propulsion, your trim, your body positioning in the water, your buoyancy mm-hmm. are great. It's worth it. Invest in time to polish those before you try to tackle anything that is remotely technical, not just caves, but like even a rebreather or right. wreck diving or deep diving, trimix diving. Your trim, propulsion, and buoyancy need to be tip top shape. So work on those. Um, put in the time for those. Once you have the basics, then to build up is much easier. But if you find someone on, along the road that says, oh, well, this is not for you or anything like that, um, l- listen to what they're saying. They might say, hey, you need more time and you need more work. That's a positive, right? That's right. positive. It's like, you can definitely do this or let's go slower, but you need more time. You need more work rather than someone that says, well, you try this. This is not for you. It's like, no. Um, so do your research. One of the things I always go for, even on my level, I try to find instructor, instructor trainers at this point that are still diving on their own time mm. for their own pleasure. That is my number one rule. If I want to go and pick someone to train me, do they just, teach, 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 or do they go and do things beyond their level of teaching? And I know at my level, it's kind of hard to find them, but they're still out there. Are they still pushing the boundaries? Those are the instructors that I go for. That's my rule. Find someone that is still passionate about what they're doing. Find someone that are doing something above their level of teaching so that when they teach you, they bring in real life experiences. They're there to help you and assist you not to stop you in your tracks, not to demean you. So if you find those people that are negative, it's not you, it's them. It's really, and the relationship, sweetheart, it's not you, it's <laughs> me. But in this case, it's reversed. So find someone else. I think that's sound advice. I, I have been through a number of mentors, even just on the recreational side and moving into the pro side. Um, and I think that it's important as, as young divers or people getting started in a dive career that make sure that you consider who your relationships are with understand what their passions are, understand where they're going. What are their goals? Are they still trying to crush goals? And if not, and they're just teaching, are they the right fit for you? Are their goals of uh, uh, going to match you when you're sitting here going, I have this goal, this goal, this goal. And, and not all of the, the best mentors are going to be women. There have been some incredible mentors in my world who have been men who have been supportive. I've also had men tell me, no, you really shouldn't be a pro and I'm just about to finish. Um, but I, I think it's important for not just women to understand in here, but um, anyone who is going down a, a dive journey or a dive path, um, be it recreational or professional and looking for a mentor, make sure the connection is there. If they're not passionate about you and your goals, find somebody else because somebody else will be there to support you and connect with you and be excited about you crushing your goals while they're still doing theirs. So I think that is absolutely sound advice. Um, And I appreciate that, especially, you know, coming from where I'm sitting. So um, one of the other questions that I, I wanted to ask you, I know that you're um, a very busy lady. I don't want to take up too much time in your morning. Um, who inspired you? 
Um, there are so many, so many. So I run a teeny tiny little group here in, in the state of Georgia called Scuba Girls of Georgia. And I also started Scuba Girls International. Um, and I have a bunch of other states that um, we've created and, and things are getting going for there uh, for those groups also. But so many of the women who are in Scuba Girls of Georgia, everybody knows who you are. So <laughs> along the way, somewhere, someone inspired you someone got you excited about crushing your goals and moving things forward in your diving career. Who were some of those influences and, and what was it that got you excited about them? Well, funny enough, my first inspiration was my dad. Oh, I love it. He was it. a military diver and I had these beautiful black and white pictures of him with the O2 rebreather. And uh, he never failed to take me to the water, including my mom. I, I, I'm an ocean child. I grew up, you know, I was looking forward to each year buying brand new pair of fins as my feet grew and, and all that. So they, I come from a family of the ocean and they took me to the ocean. Funny enough, though, my dad was so convinced that scuba diving was so dangerous for women that he never encouraged that part. He encouraged the free diving, going swimming, going in the ocean. But it was like, no, 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 scuba diving is so dangerous. And no wonders, you know, they were doing it in pure oxygen rebreather. <laughs> <laughs> crazy stuff. So the next person, and, and this is what you were saying, um, I would say the main inspiration through the years uh, was Ben Rose. Um, unfortunately, my dad and Ben passed away six weeks apart in oh. 2019. So I both, I'd lost both of them at once. But Ben was the person that started a shark dive. Ben names is in Ben's cave. I did my first cavern dive with Ben. And although Ben didn't uh, teach me any of the technical stuff or there are cave diving, he was a, a source of reference. You know, he's always on the island. So I'd be driving, finishing my cave dive. And he's the kind of family that I could just show up at the gate, you know, and the dogs will bark and Ben and Judy will come out and I'll go on the patio for a cup of tea. But he will also be the kind of person I'll be on the dive. I was like, hey, Uncle Ben, I said, I saw this. And he was doing that. And he knew exactly what it was. And uh, one of those men that had, no care in the world if you're a woman, if you're a man. It just shared a sheer passion and it absolutely loved when you had a passion for it. So you're very much a, a, an inspiration, a soft, kind hearted, so knowledgeable person. It's really funny 30 years later, people come up to say, Hey, Christine, I, I get WhatsApps now. I saw <laughs> this in the water and it was doing that. <laughs> like I turned like Uncle Ben in a certain way. And then quite a few uh, people along the way, some that I, uh, I got to meet late. Uh, Dr. Eugenie Clark was an inspiration as the shark lady um, because of how she spoke about sharks, because she was a woman that back in 1957 says we need to protect sharks. I mean, totally unheard of. I was very fortunate to be able to meet her uh, later in my in my career, when I was inducting the Women Dive Hall of Fame and exchanging you know, a few dinners and talks with her, the other ones have been uh, uh, people that I met along the way. I would have to say Andrea Zafaris and Butch Hendrick. They were Nawi instructor trainers, and they were uh, tough as nails. But they were tough with me not because I was a woman. They were tough because they wanted the best out of me, and they recognized my passion. I remember. I did my first <laughs> um, Naui instructor exams. I used to work all day and then do the Naui crossover at night. And I had to learn Imperial. I'm a metric person. We're talking about, I was 22 years old, came from Italy. My English was not what English is now. It was good, but not this. And on top of that, I'm doing physics in Imperial. And I remember I sat on my exam until two o'clock in the morning and Butch just sat there with me till I went through each question. For those who were imperial, they do not understand how hard it is to us metric people. And uh, now I can do both on a drop of the hat. But back then, and I remember he sat there and just waited till I finished it through each question and I was done. No judgment, no rush, no, oh, you know, you can do this. And and those are some of the people that I really have to thank. There, and there's way more. There's Harry Averill in Cave Country. Um, another man who does not distinctions between men and women. And it just took me under his wing as a support. He was basically 
uh, when I was doing back and forth from the Bahamas to become a cave instructor and do an internship. It took me a year and a half. I will fly from here to Orlando, stay there for two weeks, uh, co-teach with all these uh, uh, instructors. So Rose Meadows was one of the cave instructors that I caught out the most. Again, and a very beautiful, inspiring cave instructor at the time. And he will come and pick me up and drop me off and uh, provide me with the van and just give me all the suggestions. I remember we were teaching, I was just freezing. And he said, oh, you need a dry suit. So we went home and he cut up one of his old neoprene dry suits and kind of like fix it up <laughs> for the next day. So quite a lot of uh, people have been cheering along the road and very fortunate in a way. But I would say, yes, my dad, Ben Rose, Booch and Hendrik and Dresa Faris and Harry Averill, Harry Averill take like the, the lead in my- I love that. You're, you're going to have to forgive me. I can feel the love as you talk about these people and it kind of moved me. I'm, I'm an emotional girl. <laughs> it's, okay, it's okay to be emotional. Today is a very emotional day for me. So it's uh, the anniversary of my father's passing exactly oh. today, April 14th. So um, it's, it's one of those days, you know, you wake up, you live, you know, far away, um, but they're always there. And then when they're not there anymore, it's like, oh, I wish I could share this with my dad. Oh, I wish I could share that with my dad. One of the things I did when I had my kiss, I wonder made, um, Mike Young from Kiss called me and he says, he says, you have the choice of having your own serial number on the sidewinder. And at the time that was still alive. So I said, put in a 1707-1938, which was this date of birth. Oh. And that's my serial number on the rebreather. So I love that. I love that. I just, I, you know, I, I love talking to people who have amazing stories. Um, people who have incredible memories tied to things. I mean, you could just feel the passion and the emotion connected to those things. And I guess that as, as a female, I, I kind of do the same thing, but, um, when you get it from other people, it's just, it, it fills the soul and that I just, I love that. I love that a lot. Um, you are indeed a, um, woman's diver hall of fame uh, what do they call that? It's not even a candidate. You're, you're part of inductee. their class. Inductee. I'm a class or member inductee. I don't know. <laughs> um, it is, it is definitely an elite group of women who have accomplished some amazing things in the dive world. And you are no exception. Um, my understanding about what little information they provide on the website. Um, I, I, it's like a paragraph. I'm like, Really? We're gonna that's all you're gonna give people is a paragraph about how you were inducted into the woman's diving hall of fame. I want the whole story. And um I'm I'm looking through here and I'm like, okay, great. It's like six sentences. That's that's trying to summarize the 30 years of life in six sentences. Right. I'm like, that's that's I and I felt bad for everyone, because I was looking through some of the women who, I mean, you know, the doctors and the, the marine biologists and, and the photographers, and they're summing up a life's worth of experience and work in six sentences. I'm like, well, you have a website, you could either redirect people to other people's websites or let people know the real story. I mean, that's, I mean, six sentences is kind of hard to sum up what got you there in the first place? So you were nominated and someone told your story and, and, and summarized the work that you had been doing. And then you're inducted with a, a, a number of other people. Um, and they, it looks like they do it annually. Um, tell me about your experience with being inducted into the hall of fame. I, I know that the work that you have done for that particular nomination is about this big compared to all the stuff that you've done in your life with conservation and sharks and, and, you know, connecting, um, a dry cave to, uh, an, an ocean cave and being able to go, Hey, look, these things were together. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I cannot begin to describe an entire lifetime that is what got you recognized for the work that you do. That's, that's daunting. 
well, the application process is a little bit longer. So they actually look at a full CV, full stories. They want recommendation letters. It's just what you said, the summary for those that come in and read is kind of short. The Women That Were Hall of Fame has been, I would say, uh, the highlight of my career together with the Explorers Club is uh, the funny part for me is I look at it you know, from the outside is I was inducted because of everything I've done, but in a certain way, the world of star recognizing everything I've done because I was inducted. Right. And it's kind of like goes, you know, both ways. It's like, oh, my God, you've been inducted in Women Diver Hall of Fame. So you must be worth it. And it's kind of like, well, not I was inducted <laughs> because I'm worth it. Because of the work. <laughs> yeah. What is beautiful about the wood of when, when I had, that's how we call it, wood of Women Diver Hall of Fame. We say wood of is uh, at first I was just like, oh, my goodness, I'm entering a world of, the, you know, pers- a personality women, you know, all go get her. How is it going to be? Is it going to be very catty? And all of a sudden, I actually found a, a literally a sisterhood. Oh. And there's a sisterhood that goes, welcome. It's so amazing. And you're in congratulations. Now get to work that we have to actually pay this forward. <laughs> and that's how they there's are. There's more work to do. <laughs> there's more work to do. And they're just, we are a full nonprofit, completely volunteer organization. I volunteer, I do all of their social media, but there's women that do 10 times more than I do. Uh, they run the website. Side. They run the entire board of directors. We have, you know, we do the fundraisers and we have 80 scholarships and training grants that we grant, we grant to people. The next uh, deadline opens September 1st, 2022, and we grant them for studying from like junior all the way to the medical one, which is like 10 K to actually uh, earn it. And, and that was the, positive experiences and tight knit women that really support each other. You would think, well, with this competitions, I know there isn't because we're each in for different reason. And sometimes we're each in for similar reasons. Tonight, we actually, I'm actually part of the mentorship panel for technical diving. And I will be joined by Jill Heiner. Uh, Tamara Thompson and uh, Natalie Gibbs. I mean, just I was actually talking to my husband. I said I feel a little bit intimidated. You know, I was going to say those clients. are not small names. <laughs> <laughs> and the four of us will do this mentor technical diving panel for uh, our associates and the women, the young women or the young divers, because you don't need to be young to be a new diver. You there's always time to learn about technical diving and what it means so it's very much about paying it forward and that's what I love um in the old days we also used to dress up and have some parties but that was just for the fun of it but most <laughs> of it is a pay forward uh basically organization I love that that that's been my philosophy my entire life um and it's not just in you know the things that I do recreationally but in work I have taken the people who show some passion, some drive, some initiative and brought them with me. And look, I'm, I'm good at what I do over here. You're showing some initiative and some passion. I'm going to pull you in with me. Let's go do this together. Um, so I absolutely love that whole pay it forward philosophers philosophy. Someone did it for me. Um, and I've, been passionate about paying it forward ever since. Um, and, and it's not just the business world. Um, I, it's, it's also in diving. Uh, it, if you stand yeah. still long enough, I'll, I'll take you with I me. do it. <laughs> I'm a mentor for the Explorers Club. I am a supporter of our world, uh, our, our world on the water scholarship society. I host the scholars, you know, they each sleep two weeks on my couch and get two weeks of free training, whatever they need. And then sometimes across, I receive these emails from uh, usually women and there's, you know, a selected few that, again, I connect with them. I said, hey, would you like to jump on a Zoom? I have a lot of emails. I say, oh, I want to do what you do. Right. And then I answer back and I say, OK, why don't you read this? I wrote a few blogs on my nonprofit about understanding what I do. And then when I feel the energy coming back and I see some interest, I actually have invited someone to say why don't you come and stay with me for a week and die for me all provider you have to pay your costs of coming here right i can't pay for your flight ticket but they come and stay on my couch and i take them out diving for free train them for free and 
I've trained dozens and dozens of Bahamians as professionals, as dive masters and instructors. So um, sometimes I feel like I'm working just to pay it forward, but it's just very rewarding. And, and I, I feel that constantly do that. I do oh, quite a lot of mentorship online or nowadays that works really well, but I have about half a dozen people a year that come and stay with me and uh, literally learn, follow, see. Some of it is just, this is what it takes. It's five o'clock in the morning. The light goes on in the kitchen. I'm making coffee. Wake up. Time to go. <laughs> my very first uh, dive master with between, between my husband and my first dive master um, on a, a dive trip out in the Bahamas, um, he is probably partly responsible for me catching the dive bug, a Bahamian gentleman by the name of Kai Wilkinson. And he was kind, he was caring and literally gave me the experience that my first dive experience should have been. And I have since been able to pay it forward. He relocated to Montserrat. They're in the process of trying to potentially start a business out that direction. And um, he reached out to me and he was like, you know, we've got some parts we can't get a hold of here on Montserrat. Can you help me out? Like, absolutely. You're, you are responsible for me catching the dive bug. So (laughs) I, whatever you need, man, I'm sending it. What do you need? And, um, he sent me a video clip of, of them getting the compressor started and you can hear him hollering in the background and how excited he was I, that, it, you know, it's little things like that, where you're like, I've, I've paid that forward. He is responsible for, for me catching the dive bug. And now I've done something for him and we've stayed in contact. I, I absolutely, um, am a people collector and uh, that sounds like a morbid term, but, um, I collect people and, and, and everywhere I go. Um, I'm it's just one of those things where I meet somebody and I'm like, Oh, you have a beautiful soul. I love your energy. We're staying friends. Now you're stuck with me. Um, and Kai was one of those people. It's just, it's, I'm just, I'm a strange personality. Um, I cannot tell you just how wonderful this time has been for me. Um, I appreciate the work that you've done. I admire the work that you've done. I am chasing your, your coattails. I'm going to crush my own personal goals and, uh, look to crash into and break through some glass ceilings of my own. Um, what is one of the things that you would say to young women out there who are just now getting into the dive field or curious about diving, Um, and, and they're not quite sure if, if they can get into it because they don't necessarily have the support. Um, I have my own opinions, but I would love to hear what you have to say about advice for people just getting started. You're talking about financial support or mental support? Um, just anything really. I mean, yes, diving is not a, a cheap game to play in at, at any, (laughs) you mean, but, well, you know, just getting started. Well, there's a, there's a definitely uh, something that was not available when I started, which is there's a lot of scholarships and training grants and little supports you can receive from many uh, organizations. Women Dive Hall of Fame is one. The Explorers Club uh, is another one. Um, uh, the uh, Our World on Water Scholarship Society is a third one. A fourth one is Beneath the Sea. A sea of tomorrow. They still, although beneath the sea, most likely will never happen again. They still have their uh, nonprofit uh, issuing training grants and helping out. Um, for the other one that might not have the moral support is uh, nowadays online. There's a lot to find support with, and it might be worth sometimes actually a disconnected from a uh, what I would say it somewhat turns into a toxic environment that tends to crash and say uh, you can't do this or you're not good enough to do this and then find a more supportive environment and first it could be digitally via online and then it could be also uh, physically Uh, what I also recommend is uh, when you when you start um, remember that it takes time I have a lot of young people email me so I want to be like you and it's just like you're looking at 30 years in the making you, you, some of you weren't even born when I was 10 years <laughs> into this 
career. I know it sounds hard, makes me sound ancient, but you were not even born at 10 years into this career. There was no social media. Right. So um, there is a price to pay. You have to stick with it. And sometimes it's going to suck. And there's no <laughs> ways around that. But not because just people are mean, it's just because it's a fairly t- tough environment it's hard on the body especially when you start going professionally it's expensive and at the same time in the beginning non-rewarding and we need to change that we make need to make our profession something that is valued as much an airplane pilot and so when you, you grow um understand that you have to put in the time you can be a cave explorer if you just came out with 12 cave training or 16 cave training dives. You cannot. You have to go cave diving and follow the lines for a very long time before you say, oh, wow, now I'm at the end of the line and off I go with my own reel. No. It is that is <laughs> Grow laterally. Don't just grow vertically. Right. Grow laterally, meaning... Um, And this is for you as well, because you're like, oh, I have my goal, my goal, my goal. I'm going to do this course, this course, this course. It's like, stop. Do a course and then go dive it. Yes. Expand it laterally. Assist someone teaching a class. You're an instructor. Good. Go and assist someone teaching an instructor class. One more. It doesn't matter that you're an instructor. How do they do it? I've done that with my technical staff. I was a technical instructor and I reached out to my instructor trainer who trained me here. And I said, I'm coming with you to the channel. I Sorry, the Thousand Islands in Canada. And I want to see you teaching these classes in the bed visibility, strong, cold water for me of the St. Lawrence River. And I'm just going to co-teach. I just want to see how you do it there because I've done it here. So grow laterally. Take opportunities. Somebody offers you the opportunity to learn something you're thinking about. That's not really my goal. Is that eventually will come back. Right. Right. So those are my two things. You have to put in the work. You have to put in the time. Sometimes you have to grind your teeth. And then don't just think up also things horizontally. That's beautiful advice. Beautiful advice. I certainly appreciate your time. I have absolutely loved spending this time with you. Thank you for sharing your, your wealth of knowledge and your excitement and the passion, uh, for the diving world. Um, I am hoping that I will see you again sometime in the future. I am, um, pretty passionate and excited about your shark courses, which I've asked for, for my birthday. We'll see what happens. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that I'll see you again in the future for an extended period of time, just because I'm dying to study with you. Um, but, um, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your time and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Terry. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Christina. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Bye. Thanks.